Hey, my name is Matthew Smith. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at Northeastern University, and I'm here to talk to you about reproducing freedom. I'm going to start the talk actually by uh, focusing on our current situation, because this is, after all, the ethics of COVID. And the situation we face today seems to be one of existential dread, where the fundamental question that we have to struggle with is, uh, questions of life and death. And given the fact that this ultimate vulnerability, the vulnerability of death is so present in our, present in our minds, um, it's understandable that we might take aggressive move, measures like shutting down um, schools and shutting down businesses and instituting stay at home orders. But thankfully, and I mean really, really thankfully, the uh, virus is not, um, Near, the fatality rate of the, of the infection is not nearly as horrible as many of the other pestilences that have run through human history, nor is the infection as tran easily transmissible as, say, measles. So the existential threat of COVID has receded a little bit, and we've begun to ask other questions. And these other questions that we're asking are not questions about epidemiology, because ultimately the questions of epidemiology aren't questions of policy so much as questions about how, thing, how a particular disease will transmit and kill, but rather questions about how we ought to respond to that. And predictably, one of the questions that has emerged is a question of freedom. And that's gonna be the topic of the lecture today. Now, when I talk about freedom here, it's important to note that there's other values that people have raised in response to the changes in our political economy as a result of COVID. Some people have talked about justice and other people have talked in terms of distributive justice, or uh, the burdens of the shutdown falling unequally on the least well off, for example. Uh, other people may have talked about uh, efficiency and I'm not sure efficiency is a value, but people might say, well, um, we need uh, to sacrifice lives in the name of efficiency, for example. I'm not gonna um, weigh in on any of those issues. There's another issue though that really has become prominent and not merely prominent but because of the people who are protesting, the few people who are protesting in front of state houses saying, open up the economy, but rather just people talking, and I think it's an issue that is worth um, us reflecting on, people talking about the way in which state intervention in response to COVID has, has led to limitations on how we lead our lives. In other words, it's led to changes in the regimes that governing freedom. And so the real issue ends up being the uh, contrast between how we should respond to say the threat of this, um, virus and uh, we've, we've had to um, manage or find, find a balance between how we respond to the threat of this violence and uh, the value of freedom. Now this lecture is not actually about uh, how we ought to manage that response, what the proper balance should be. The lecture is about freedom and the nature of freedom and I think that there's a really important way in which we need to rethink freedom, we need to talk differently about freedom, and that, that we need to do that before we begin or before we can really get an excellent grip on how to make sense of the kinds of trade-offs that all kinds of policy challenges pose to us um, when it comes into um, the, uh, when, when questions of freedom are raised. So to that end, let's begin with some of the familiar ways in which freedom has been characterized in the past. For most of uh, 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 modern history, there's basically been two notions of freedom at work. The first notion of freedom is the familiar Hobbesian one. Negative freedom is what Isaiah Berlin called it famously. Uh, Hobbes also called it, Thomas Hobbes, a great uh, political theorist of the 18th, 17th century, called it corporeal freedom or corporal freedom. And he writes, I'm gonna quote him now, by liberty is understood, according to the proper signification of the word, the absence of external impediments, which impediments oft take away part of a man's power to do what he would, but cannot hinder him from using the power left him, according as his judgment and reason shall dictate. And then later on, uh, Hobbes writes, a free man is he that in those things which by his strength and what he's able to do and is not hindered to do what he has a will to do. We're gonna come back to this because I think Hobbes is onto something. But what people mostly focus on is the absence of external impediment. Uh, Isaiah Berlin, famous uh, philosopher of the, or political theorist of the mid 20th century wrote, 
A liberty is negative. It, a liberty in the negative sense involves an answer to the question, what is the area within which the subject or person or group of persons is or should be left to do or be what he is able to do or be without interference by other persons. So there's this notion of the absence of interference. And uh, when uh, Berlin characterizes it, it's the absence of interference by other persons. Now, there's another model, which is Republican liberty, which is freedom as non-domination. Now, Republican liberty is the liberty that uh, some people associate, say, with the Republican tradition of the ancient era, um, the Roman Republican tradition in particular. Um, but we might, uh, we, uh, the, the contemporary exponent of this theory is Philip Pettit. And he writes that uh, people enjoy freedom as non-domination to the extent that no one else is able to interfere with them on an arbitrary basis. So the idea here is that freedom is understood as the absence of arbitrary interference. Uh, a good example of this actually comes from Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, who writes uh, about a wife who relies, quote, on mincing steps and beguiling smiles to keep her husband sweet and to get her way in a variety of choice. But she doesn't succeed, thereby in getting out from under his will, escaping the constraint that, that it represents. However kindly or gullible, however much he's a pushover, the husband remains a master. And to live under the will or power of a master, to live in potesti domini, is not to be free. Now, this model of freedom is model of freedom as absence. It's the absence of external impediment, the absence of interference, the absence of domination. So I think that this is actually really important. And I'm not saying that these models of freedom are bad models of freedom. But nonetheless, I think that they actually put the cart before the horse. Hobbes, in fact, perhaps got it best. But we didn't really focus on what he said after the absence of external impediment. Why is freedom valuable? It's not valuable because of what's not there, but rather freedom is valuable because of what is preserved by something not being there. And this, I think, is the essence of a contemporary notion of freedom that we need to recover and we need to push to the front of our thinking about freedom. This is the notion of freedom as ability or freedom as a capacity. This notion of freedom as an ability or freedom as a capacity is familiar to those who have read Amartya Sen or Martha Nussbaum in their accounts of uh, capability theory. Now the notion of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna largely build on what, they're, on what they have to say. But what's interesting to me is that a lot of political theory hasn't really taken up Sen and Nussbaum's characterization of freedom as the central uh, understanding of freedom. And they focused more on freedom as the absence of domination or the absence of external impediment. I'll offer a few views about why I think that this is uh, the case, but I just wanna uh, have one other note um, to illustrate how thoroughly this thought of freedom as absence has uh, uh, expand, has passed through um, thinking. And in this case, this is from, um, uh, this is from a piece very recently published by well-known uh, historian and political theorist. Um, on the one hand, the historian is uh, uh, Corey Robin, the political theorist is Alex Gurevich. Uh, and they write, quote, in a recently published article in Polity, quote, the promise of freedom begins with the fact of unfreedom. The source or locus of unfreedom changes over time, but unfreedom today is most widely experienced in and because of the economy, and so on. And then they say the unfreedom of the economy has two dimensions, domination in the workplace and the extension of market discipline to all areas of social life." End quote. Now, this approach to freedom, this notion that freedom needs to be understood in terms of unfreedom, the freedom needs to be in terms, understood in terms of uh, the impediment or in terms of domination, again, obscures why freedom is valuable. Why is domination in this uh, area bad? Why is the existence of an impediment bad? It's bad because it prevents the manifestation of something valuable, namely our capability to lead our lives as we see fit. This is why I think we need to begin with thinking our thinking about freedom around as freedom as an ability or freedom as a capacity or freedom as a capability. Any of those words are fine. And in particular, it's freedom uh, as a capability to act in a certain way. So in a, um, a phrase, we might say, I think of freedom as agency, where agency is the philosophical term 
for the capacity to act. Sometimes I'll say people have individual freedoms and I'll refer to that as agential capacities. So the idea here then is I am free insofar as I can act and I am unfree insofar as I'm prevented from acting. Now I may be prevented from acting because say I wish to walk down a path and a boulder is in the way and because the boulder is in a way I cannot walk down the path, I'm unfree. I may, be, I may uh, want to um, uh, live my life in a certain way, I may want to sleep in till 10, but I cannot sleep until 10 because I need to get up and go to work lest I lose my job and my boss won't let me change my hours. So I'm unfree in that sense. There's a variety of other ways in which I might be unfree, but what's important is that what I'm unfree is un unfree to live my, to act in a certain way. So I want to emphasize that there's an important point in which being able to do things is not the same thing as being able to experience things or being, unless experiencing something is an action, I don't think it is. For example, I experience dreams, but dreaming is not an action. Um, and similarly, it's not affective, right? So uh, to say that I'm free to feel a certain way is a different kind of freedom. Now I am fine with saying there's many notions of freedom and I'm only focusing on a particular notion of freedom. Okay, but the notion of freedom that I'm focusing on is the one I think is the most important, the core one. Now, many people might say, wait a minute, this seems to really be about the freedom to think in a certain way. That's the most important kind of freedom. But again, the notion of freedom to think or freedom of conscience and so on and so forth is never just about thought. In fact, in the first instance, it's not about thought. It's about the ability to express oneself and the different ways in which that expression may be published. It may be made into something that can be publicized. So fundamentally then, freedom is about a capability to act in a certain way. Freedom is about an ability or it is an ability. So if we think of freedom in this fashion, then we might ask ourselves, what is an agential capacity? What is human agency? What is the ability to act in a certain way? That's what I'm gonna focus the, the next part of my talk on. And this is where we get into the title of the talk, Reproducing Freedom. The thesis is this, the ability to act, freedom has to be produced. It is not something that exists just out there waiting to be encumbered, blocked, dominated, whatever. Um, and this is really important because, and here's really where my critique lies. The fundamental problem, I think, that a lot of talk about freedom on the left and the right uh, has is that it doesn't take seriously the fact that freedom is materially realized and must be produced and reproduced through social activities of production and reproduction. And a way in which I can characterize this is the following. Much of the concern on the left and the right about freedom is about legal constraints on freedom, formal constraints on freedom laws or contracts, whatever that prevent people that say so-and-so is such and such is not a permissible activity. And on this view, if all we did was change the laws, that would make people freer. And it's true often if what we do is change the laws, it will make people freer, but it will make people freer because there was in fact a certain ability that was being produced and that was just simply being constrained by the law, right? So you might, think of, uh, you might think of it this way. Uh, I might be able to express myself to publicize my ideas on the internet because there's the internet there for me to use. But the laws are such that if I were to do that, I would be punished. It's been made illegal for me to do it. But if you removed the law pro that prohibited me from doing this, I would thereby become free to do it. But in this case, what the ability to express myself has existed materially out there for all this time. It was just the law that was blocking me. I think that this is, this again encourages us to fail to appreciate the material that freedom must be materially produced. An argument I haven't yet given yet that freedom must be materially produced. I'm about to do it. But I, I want to say one other thing, which is that the, on the left, I think the focus on the formal characterization of freedom, in particular freedom in terms of legal constraints, or rather unfreedom in terms of legal constraints, is because on the left, the focus is often on property rights and property rights relations and therefore property law. And so consequently, if you focus mostly on who owns what, then you focus mostly on the formal arrangement 
of rights and duties and not in terms and not on the material uh, uh, organization of the world. And that means that you often will say, well, look, the material organization of the world, we'll leave that, think about the factory. But when we talk about freedom, what we want to talk about is who owns what. Again, I'm not saying that these things aren't important, but I'm saying that they leave out this really important element. This really important element, namely that freedom is uh, an ability and abilities are materially realized and must be produced is what I'm going to argue for now. So let's talk for a moment about an ability. Let's talk in particular about the ability to walk down the street. Now I can't walk down the street if there's no street for me to walk down. Let's take something like a path. Well, now because of the coronavirus, I have my kids with me most of the time, but not for right now. And I think my wife looking after the kids while I give this lecture. But normally around this time of day, I take the kids out to a variety of different kinds of green spaces, forests, whatever, so on and so forth. And we go for walks and we walk down paths. Now, if those paths didn't exist, we couldn't walk down the path. I would be not able to walk down the path. In a fundamental way, I would be unfree to walk down that path. I would lack the ability to walk down that path. And in fact, what is the difference between a path in a forest not being there and a gate blocking from that path? There is no difference. In both cases, my ability to walk down the path, my kid's ability to walk down the path no longer exists, be it a locked gate preventing entrance to the forest where there is the path or the uh, removal of the path, say, because some forest rangers went in and put a whole bunch of new trees where the path used to be. In both cases, my ability to walk down that path would be eliminated. Consider furthermore, uh, another travel-based account, namely driving. Look, I, I want the ability to drive. The ability to drive is essential for many Americans, uh, both for good life and for their identities. The ability to drive though, presupposes the existence of streets, highways, roads, avenues, boulevards, et cetera, on which they can drive. You take those away, people are no longer able to drive. Aha, you say, I can drive just fine. I'll just drive through the country on my off-road. Yeah, but if you don't have an off-road truck to drive in or whatever else can manage driving off-piste, off then you will not be able to drive yourself. So in this case, if you lack the roads or you lack the vehicle or you, in the case of walking in the paths, you lack the paths, you don't have the ability to do these things. You might take even step back a minute. If I'm not able to get gas for my car, I'm not able to drive. And so here again, my freedom, my ability to drive has not been realized. I cannot have, I cannot exercise this ability. I'm unfree. In this way, I'd like to emphasize that our abilities must be, as it were, provisioned. I need a path, right? I need a car. I need gas. I need streets. I need highways. All these things in order for me to do these things. Take, for example, cooking. Most people in um, industrialized countries cook using some form of gas or electric range. Now, if you don't have a gas or an electric range, you can't cook. Now, maybe you can do some sort of nifty raw cooking, say with lemon or acids or so on and so forth. Or perhaps you use a microwave, so let's get rid of the microwave. Now you have no oven, you have no range stovetop, and you have no microwave oven. How are you going to cook? I mean cook, I don't mean chop things up and make the salad, I mean cook. You're not gonna be able to. Your ability to cook has been limited. There are all sorts of infrastructural requirements in order to be able to live one's life in accordance to how one wants to live one's life. And it's the provisioning of these infrastructural components that allows one to do these things. It is our abilities are constituted by these uh, uh, systems that are provisioned. And so we have to ask ourselves then, how, is, how are they provisioned? Well, they're provisioned by processes of social reproduction. Roads are built by people who are, well, doing the building. And we gotta get that, we gotta get the materials for the roads assembled and transported to where the road is gonna be built. And there needs to be a variety of other kinds of logistical requirements that are met. In short, what we need to do is we need to think about freedom as something that is provisioned through the activities of society. So now I'm gonna recap really quickly because I was going rather fast there and walk through step um, in uh, uh, just a um, sketchy form, uh, step by step how we got, how I got here. We started by saying that freedom is more than an absence of something, but rather freedom is the presence of something, namely it's the presence of an ability. 
And then I argued that this ability is something that has to be uh, provisioned, that abilities are out there in the world. There are material conditions for those abilities to exist. So I gave the example of a path or a road or a car or gas. And then I said that these uh, material conditions have to be provisioned through social practices, namely through um, people getting together and say building those roads or um, uh, sadly uh, uh, drilling for that gas and refining it and then shipping it to uh, gas stations and so on and so forth. Freedom is constituted by these systems. I call them reliance systems. Uh, because they're the uh, systems that we rely on in order to act. They are the systems that constitute our capacities. So freedom on this view is realized in these systems. This is a, on this view then, what we really need to do when we ask about freedom is we need to ask about how are these systems being provisioned? And this actually can help us understand that disruptions in the provisioning of these systems can then affect our freedom. So for example, if we can no longer, if gas can no longer be provisioned to us, then we are no longer free to drive, right? And you don't need a law saying driving is illegal, you just need to not have gas provisioned to you. And in many ways then, uh, questions of supply chains and infrastructure and stuff like that are just questions of, or can be understood as questions of the nature of human freedom, the particular historical manifestation of human freedom. When we live in a world of, in this world of uh, uh, the coronavirus, we live in a world where freedom is curtailed. Now, an interesting uh, way thing that's come up is that people think, well, gee, the, the, you know who's curtailing my freedom is the government by instituting these laws. But in many ways, what's happening is that people have uh, chosen without necessarily uh, 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 the state forcing them to change their habits, to change the way they lead their lives. And in this way, uh, they've uh, drawn back from say running certain businesses or they've drawn back from uh, certain kinds of activities that then eliminate people's abilities to do something. I'll give a simple example. Imagine you're part of a recreational sports league. So say there's a sport I happen to play called Ultimate Frisbee and uh, we had a league that was set up to play this spring. But as a result of the coronavirus, we, the, the pandemic, uh, the league was suspended. I'm no longer free to play this game. Now, you might say, well, gee, of course you're free to play this game. Uh, the law doesn't prohibit you from playing this game. Let's assume, let's assume. And uh, the parks are still open and so on and so forth. And all you need is a Frisbee and a couple, and you know, uh, five, uh, 10 to 14 other people and off you go. Now, that's true. But if I can't get those 10 to 14 other people to play, then I can't play. In other words, uh, if, people are unwilling to engage in a particular coordinated activity, then I lose a capacity, namely the capacity to play this game. That's a simple example, but it should reveal something that's important, which is that freedom is socially provisioned, which is to say that freedom is social. I'd like to say that we should no longer think of freedom as independence, but rather freedom as dependence. We are free when we can reliably depend upon the systems that uh, constitute our abilities working correctly. And when those systems can no, no longer work cor correctly, we can no longer depend on them. And we are thereby rendered unfree. Now, sometimes we are blocked from those systems. We can't activate them. Say if you're thrown in jail, you no longer can access a variety of the systems that you relied upon in order to live your life in certain ways. But let's put aside that example and just think about the life that we're leading, many of us are leading now, well, for where, for example, schools are closed. If schools are closed, you can no longer depend on the schools to look after one's children and consequently one must look after one's children oneself. And then that creates conditions where there's only so many hours in the day and you're no longer able to do a variety of the things that you're able to do. I'm not free to do many of the things I used to be free to do because I must look after my children. Now, it's an interesting thing someone might say. How is it that uh, 
your, um, I mean, I could be, I am free to do these things. I could just let my children not get looked after. But it is important to appreciate the fact that freedom is not just the raw ability to do something, but the ability to do something that you want to do. And this is where things get a little bit complicated. And I'm not going to get into the details here about how to resolve these complications. I just merely want to acknowledge them. And to say that I don't merely say, uh, want to go for a run. I want to go for a run without, say, endangering my children, without leaving them alone, without anyone to watch out, watch over them. I want to be able to say, write some, uh, write more of the draft of my book um, without endangering my children by leaving them alone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these different things that would get in the way of me engaging in certain kinds of activities. And uh, 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 without compromising certain values in that way. In those ways, I'm unfree as well. That raises a variety of complications I'm not gonna get into, um, but I wanted to acknowledge them and they'd be worth, uh, they're worth exploring and I intend to explore them and I have explored them in other places. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the extent to which our freedom is materially realized and particularly the way in which our freedom uh, uh, our abilities are materially realized, our abilities to think creatively are materially realized. Uh, we oftentimes think uh, with our hands and we think about the world in terms of stuff out there in the world. Our imaginations are constructed out of stuff in the world that we've encountered. And oftentimes when we're imagining things, trying to imagine say new worldscapes, what we do is we simply draw from the world that we're familiar with. And that's why uh, uh, fa fantasy uh, so often, um, or should we say science fiction or contemporary fantasy in certain ways, so often reflects the existing world we live in and doesn't actually uh, depart that much from it. And that's why, for example, we could read, say, Thomas More's Utopia, which was imagining a place that wasn't, that, well, that it was utopic, in other words, it didn't exist, it was utopic in the sense that it was uh, a good place, or the best place, um, but it was meant to be a place that was utterly unlike any of the places that existed in, 16th, in the 16th century. And yet when you encounter Thomas More's Utopia, it sure looks a lot like uh, the world of 16th century England or 16th century Europe. That's not surprising because our imaginations are constrained by what is and what has been. In other words, our imaginations are constrained by the material reality that we encounter ourselves. This even can happen in the case of say, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, we see this um, even in the case of the art of the little, little children. Little ch children do not begin by drawing fantastical scenes. They begin by drawing say skies with flowers and suns and so on and so forth, what is before them. And then you might imagine, well, architects, in order to imagine different kinds of shapes, they manipulate paper into say, well, I could build something that looks like this, or I could build something that looks like this. Or you can imagine uh, one of these postmodern architects uh, uh, manipulating paper or cardboard or some other kind or some other kind of surface in order to uh, 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 work out what it is that they can build. In other words, our thinking, our very imaginative processes, which seem so utterly um, uh, immaterial are in fact realized very often in the material and built on the material. So similarly, if you eliminate, uh, if, you, if you render everything gray and stale, uh, if you eliminate difference in the uh, built environment, you can negatively affect people's imaginative capacities. Uh, or so I surmise, that's a, a prediction on the basis of my view. In other words, the very uh, freedom of thought, which is supposed to be a counterexample to the materiality of freedom, turns out to be something that arguably is material itself. And so again, we need to keep thinking about the ways in which radical shifts, radical um, ruptures in our daily lives, say as a result of pandemics or as a result of uh, natural disasters, so-called, or other kinds of ruptures can negatively affect our freedoms, not through state intervention or state oppression, but rather through scrambling the very infrastructural systems that constitute our agential capacities. Freedom is material, freedom is spatial. It is something that has to be uh, 
produced and then when it degrades, reproduced. It's something that we can actually uh, construct through policy interventions. For example, how we organize our city streets can affect our abilities. If we don't build bike paths, people cannot bike. Yes, indeed, people can bike, I suppose, by biking on a busy street, but they'll get run over and killed, which I think is a clear case of not being free to bike. Similarly, if people, if sidewalks are uh, too narrow, people cannot, they are not free to socially distance from other people. In other words, people are not able to keep the required distance from one another as they move through their lives without walking into the street and getting hit by a car. So there's a lack of freedom there. And I think that repurposing our language of freedom with this in mind is important. In fact, it serves a really important political goal. If we think freedom always in terms of an absence, and we think of freedom always in terms of formal relations, property rights relations, contractual relations, and so on and so forth, then we fail to see that the built environment, understood quite broadly, actually is one of the primary determinants of our freedom. That we can, in some ways, build our way out of unfreedom or build our way into freedom. And by building, I don't just mean mega projects. We can simply repurpose. You don't need to build extra sidewalks in order to change the flow of traffic. That can be done just by changing the law and maybe putting up some cones or some or a few uh, 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 barriers. That way, we would then expand the sidewalk. It's not that big a deal to build new paths. It's not that big a deal not to develop spaces, leave more parkland. It's not that big a deal. That is, it's not about a mega project if you say want to uh, close a street and make it so that that becomes pedestrianized. In other words, we have capacities to shift the ways in which we move through our, the spaces that we inhabit without having to have massive building projects, without having to be destructive in the sense that we have to burn fossil fuels, exceed our planetary boundaries. Similarly, we can expand our abilities by uh, making some small in, uh, um, infrastructural changes. Uh, it may require um, several factories to produce new solar panels, but nonetheless, we could produce solar panels and produce ba batteries and produce smart meters and so on and so forth, and then have them installed on everyone's homes and then institute the appropriate property rights regime to govern who owns what and where the revenues go and management rights and management liabilities and so on and so forth. And we could do all that without having a massive retrofitting of um, every single element of society and thereby um, make solar power the dominant form of power in certain regions that get enough sun. And then we would be free to uh, do certain things that without destroying the environment, say free to run, uh, I don't know actually if it could work for air conditioning. Um, uh, my co-author of my uh, book, The Spatial Contract, right here, could uh, uh, say more about that, uh, Dr. Stephen Hall. But anyway, the point here is that freedom is the sort of thing that can be produced, reproduced, it can be uh, generated through the repurposing of space, it can be generated through small material interventions into exist the existing infrastructure. We don't have to have grand, uh, oftentimes horribly unjust uh, raising of elements of the city, uh, a, a renewal of the horrible forms of urban renewal in order to expand and transform our agential capacities so that we become more free and not less free. What does this all have to do with COVID in the final instance? Well, I actually think it has to do with COVID because so much of what we think about, so much of what we talk about when we think about COVID is captured in two terms. One, reducing the number of deaths, and two, eliminating or instituting government restrictions on human abilities. But what we really need to think about is freedom in the sense of, um, I'm sorry, about restricting uh, human freedom. But that is the notion of restricting human freedom in the old sense, the notion of, of um, freedom as absence. But if we start thinking of freedom as presence, freedom as actually uh, a capacity that people have that is socially produced, 
Then we might start asking some questions about the proper way to respond to COVID as being the um, increasing our capacity to respond to COVID. We've already seen that actually uh, when people talk about not flattening the curve, but raising the line, increasing our healthcare capacity. And, and that was almost instantly understood as a socially produced capacity as something that meant, had to be socially manifested. That um, doctors would be able to treat, an individual doctor would have new abilities to treat COVID if those abilities were socially produced in certain ways, say by um, repurposing certain parts of hospitals, say by uh, uh, making some temporary um, uh, uh, hospitals and so on and so forth. But we didn't think about that social production of new abilities when it came to us, the people who were locked down or quarantined. Zoom is about it in many ways, but uh, what else could we have done? Are there forms of human sociality that could have been activated, that would have increased our capacities, but not put us at risk or not put us at significant risk, that would have allowed us to become more free in the context of quarantine. I'm certain there are, and I'm not talking about kumbaya moments. I'm talking about ways in which we could have thought, and there were people thinking about this, but it should have been more upfront. We should have actually had politicians right up front saying, what we're going to do is increase our abilities in many, many ways. We may not be able to drive to work, but we can walk on the streets and keep socially distanced. You know, I go for runs and I still have to watch out for cars hitting me. Well, there's all these different runners and people walking on the streets and kids playing in the streets and there's still cars zooming down these streets. Why are we doing that? The ability to safely run, safely play in the streets, the ability that could have been socially produced through some more careful thoughts about our urban infrastructure. The same thing goes for a variety of other things. We could have rethought the way in which we used parks. We could have expanded the different kinds of capacities that we had through different kinds of social orderings, through different kinds of engagement with public spaces, through the production of new public spaces. If we had led with that, we might have not thought of this as a, as a moment of collapse inward, of loss exclusively, but actually as an opportunity to reproduce, or in some cases, produce new new capacities to become freer in one way and less free in other ways. It's a tall order, but this is a difficult time. We could have lived up to it. God knows we had plenty of time to think about these things. Anyway, that's the idea of reproducing freedom. And uh, I go over in greater detail actually in this book, The Spatial Contract, available for you online, uh, published by Manchester University Press. Um, and uh, I would love to talk more about it. So if anyone has questions about it, feel free to email me at matthew.smith at northeastern.edu. And I just wanted to thank uh, Marcus and uh, the Center for Ethics at the University of Toronto for this amazing opportunity to give this little lecture. It's a weird thing to talk to nobody except for this glowing green dot at the top of my computer screen. Uh, but nonetheless, I do hope there are some people out there watching and I do appreciate if you've stuck through throughout this uh, 39 minutes as I've jabbered on. Thanks a lot again to the organizers. Thanks to you for joining me. And um, I hope that when we get through the other, get out to the other end of this, we are going to be able to become freer, to produce more abilities, reproduce the old ones. Thanks a lot and good day. <laughs>